Introduction. Hi. Who are you? What are your, what's your I'm name? I'm Dana Lynn Bailey, and I'm learning how to deadlift for the first time in my life. <laughs> Who are you? What do you do? I am Brandon Lilly, and I'm a powerlifter, creator of the Q Method, and uh, here to help Dana Lynn Bailey. Yes. Fix the forms. So there's a lot of people that saw in my video, saw you getting advice from you, and everyone wanted audio. Ah, we're giving you the audio today. So now you know what's going on. Yes. And I think the important takeaway for this is to understand that what I'm saying is my coaching viewpoint. I'm not trying to tell you that it's a fact. I'm not trying to tell you that it's the only way. But these are things that I look for in a lifter. And when we applied them to, to Dana yesterday, her deadlift went from good to really, really good. And, uh, and that's the, the American way is to put more weight on the bar. We have to go back to specializing in the technique to add more weight on the bar. So she's extremely strong and her body type will allow her to get stronger much more quickly than her technique will. So she's gonna have to really step back, focus on the technique if she ever wants to be maximally strong. So as she's transitioned from repetition work to heavy work, technique comes into play hugely. So that's what we're doing today. Here we go. <laughs> So pull how you were. Pull it how I was? Mm -hmm. Re regular? Or? Yeah, just go ahead and pull regular because that's where your, your, your biggest flaw is. Oh, no. Okay, so what we saw right here, the first thing, so many people say, I hurt my back deadlifting, I hurt my back deadlifting. Well, if you look at the reasons why, Come here. You have these two erectors on your back, and then you have these massive quads, hamstrings, and glutes. These are never going to be stronger than all of this down here. So if you're using the back as Dana was just then, you are going to be more susceptible to injury. So we have to transfer the power down to the legs. So one of the cues that I like to tell people all the time in conventional is jump. Think about jumping. And nobody jumps with their back down like this. You jump in a position to, to go high, keep the chest up, shoulders back, reach. Same thing here. So my cue for her is to imagine jumping. And a lot of times that's not enough to just say it. So one of my physical cues, a lot of times with lifters that have a glute deactivation, you can touch the glute and then all of a sudden they can feel it working. I just come behind the lifter, put my hands on the side and I tell them to imagine squatting. Don't even worry about the bar. Just put your hands up in front of you for balance. Go ahead and squat down a few times. Up, down, up, down, up, good. So she can do the movement that we're trying to get her into. And what you wanna see is everything lock into place at one time. You don't wanna see the hips locked out with the back dragging. You don't wanna see the back too high to where you're shifting your, your legs underneath the bar, kind of like a, a ramp or a hitch. So everything works together, jump. That's the cue that I give. So if she's gonna go down to the bar this time, she's gonna take an over-over grip. A lot of people, as they get heavier, will switch to an over-under, but just for these purposes, she's over-over. So if she comes out, look what she's doing. When she turns this elbow in, do it, push the ground back out. Look, when she does this in, the lat engages, and the shoulders start to retract a little bit. Now as the hips drop, she's gonna pull this back even more, and she's gonna lean with the hip. So go ahead and stand straight up like a squat. See how everything came together uniformly? Do one more. Now, straighten your legs just to show. Now what she's gonna do before she lifts is drop the hips under. That's gonna create a stretch reflex. That's gonna give you more power, explosive power, kind of like in a jump. When you jump, you don't get down here and wait. So to create that reflex, she pumps the legs. Boom, go. Perfect. You can see the big difference is she's no longer hung out here and the bar can't drift. The bar's in against the body. She's standing up correctly. That's a quick fix on the convention. Now, she's not a sumo deadlifter, as I would say, because sumo is very, very wide. She's kind of what we call a frog stance. Eddie Cohn is one of the greatest lifters ever without argument. I think he's the greatest lifter ever, but I don't want to put up a debate on the internet, but he is the greatest in my mind. He pulled this stance. Dana's very, very athletic. So we're not gonna have her take too wide because sumo is so much more technical 
whereas the conventional is more of an athletic move. So in this position, this is her first movement. This is where she started from. Go ahead and pull as you did. See, again, she led with the back. And the best way to video yourself in any of the lifts, squat, bench, or deadlift, is from the side. Because when you see the bar, if it has variation, front or back, that means the body is not moving as fast as possible or as efficiently as possible. So now, go ahead and pull another one. Yep, and watch the bar pass. Okay. It looks pretty close, but she actually pulled around because her back was in a straight line. Now, go back down, set the hands, and now I'm gonna give her the same cues. Tuck the elbows in. I always tell people to imagine, you know, when somebody comes up and tickles you and you kind of like flex, imagine that reaction before you start the deadlift because that's gonna lift the chest, retract the scapula, get straight up and down, push. See how much more uniform and how much straighter the bar was. Do it again. This is now a leg movement. I tell people to imagine being in a leg press and just pushing away from the floor with the legs. So many people think this is a pull. I tell people it's a press. So the more action that you can get created with the quads, the hamstrings, and the glutes, the more power you're gonna drive through the floor. And this, the hands are just a hook. And one other thing that's really important, Dana has really good biceps. A lot of guys tear their biceps uh, on deadlift, so a way to avoid that is to straighten the tricep out, flex it down, it does two things. It's very, very nearly impossible to tear your bicep with a flexed tricep, but it also lengthens the arms. So it's gonna keep the arms hanging longer. As so many people try to generate force off the floor by pulling with the arms, you, how do you think you're gonna pull more with the bicep than you will with the quads and glutes? Yeah. So do it again, let the arms hang, Good strong tricep tension. Everything locks at once, that's a perfect deadlift. Absolutely perfect. Now, something I wanna say, Dana has a, has a wrist injury and she was using some straps earlier and that's a big debate issue on the internet and it drives me crazy. Um, I am not a person that uses straps a lot on my deadlift. I was a mechanic. I used my hands a lot when I was younger uh, I have very, very thick, uh, meaty hands. I've never had a problem with grip. A lot of people tend to, to say that the, uh, the straps will cause problems with grip. If you have a grip issue, train your grip. But here's the thing about straps. They can get you further into the rep ranges where your lats are still capable of going but your hands are torn up. Use the straps. There's no reason not to, especially if you have an injury. Her using straps today, if we were to work up, will allow her to deadlift versus not deadlifting. And also, she's not gonna be distracted by the pain of her wrist. So, I am a person who says deadlift as much as you can, do lat pull downs as much as you can without straps, but when the time comes and your hands are beat up, keep going, use the straps. It's not, it doesn't make you weak, it makes you smart. It allows you to keep going further. And uh, for me, you know, people talk about the sumo or the, the frog stance here. Well, it's cheating, well, if somebody can pull more than you, you got beat. If that's allowed within the rules, you got beat. Don't make excuses, just get stronger. And that's why you know, we encourage Dana to take this stance over the conventional because it was just more fluid. Why would you not do what moves better, feels better, looks better if it's within the rules? Do what works. Yeah. People were asking yesterday about the, uh, the close, everyone was very concerned about what was going on there. <laughs> All right, so this, this goes back to the, uh, the weightlifting background. This is called a snatch grip deadlift, okay? The reason it's a, a snatch grip is in the snatch and weightlifting, you have a very, very wide, wide grip. And for uh, the, the reason for powerlifting, what you're gonna do is you're gonna be able to really, really exaggerate the lockout and the use of the glutes and that high tie in point of the hamstring. And so many lifters fail between the knee and their hips at the deadlift. So this is gonna train you to not only have more glute activation, but more power through the hamstrings and the glutes. So if that's where your weak point is, you're gonna have a very narrow stance. If you have different weak areas, we change the foot position. But for Dana, she was talking about being weaker towards the top, narrow foot position, wider hand position. Now watch, 
people again will think this is a back movement because she's pulling with her back. Actually, what I want her to imagine in her mind is flexing the glutes and hamstrings to push them forward so that elevates the bar off the ground. And then when you get to the top, a nice one count or a one two count to really flex the glutes and fire them in. This is something that you do with 50 to 60 percent of a maximum, a training maximum. I always tell power athletes 90 percent of a, of a one rep maximum is your training max. So if you pull 500 pounds, a training max is 450. And for Dana, where she pulls around 300 pounds, this is, you know, 135. This is just a little bit under a good working weight for her. But at eight to 12 repetitions, she's gonna stand up and her hamstrings and her glutes are really gonna be burning. And if you can learn to activate those muscles, they're gonna fire better from the floor when you step back out. And when you do accessory work, the goal should never ever be heavy on the accessories. What is, what is accessory work? It's fixing a weakness. And how do you fix a muscular weakness? Hypertrophy, okay? You do the CNS loading on the power lift, the main deadlift as you would in comp, and then you start breaking down the lift into how you move. We talked about on the deadlift for Dana, you know, she's gonna have to go from the transfer of power from her back, where she is very, very strong, where she wants to creep over and bend more. She's gonna have to transfer the power to her quads, hamstrings, and glutes. So right now, her back is the most dominant lift, or the dominant muscle group of her muscle groups. So when she's doing the main lift, it's gonna be deadlift as she would in the competition, then an accessory deadlift of some sort, snatch grip, block pulls as we did upstairs, or conventional because she's doing the frog stance. Now, her weaknesses would run as in hamstrings, glute, quad, and then her back is the strongest. So a hierarchy of movement would be weakest muscle group first, glutes and hamstrings, something like leg curls, Romanian deadlifts, um, you know, anything to really activate the hamstring. Glute bridges, I know they get a lot of flack on the internet. You don't have to do a thousand pounds to make them good. Just feel the weight. But I think this right here, this is the number one glute builder for me. I went from 725 raw deadlift to 804 in four months, and this was the only change I made was the snatch grip with a narrow stance. Something else, if you're trying to develop speed off the floor where so many lifters are slow, stand on a deficit. A one inch deficit will create so much more power because you'll have to drop the hips lower, create a lower starting point, you'll get more leg drive, and you'll get used to that amount of leg drive. So competition comes and that's gone, you're pulling an, S, an inch less, but you're also used to getting an inch lower, so you'll actually drive. And the one cue I keep giving Dana on her bench, and on her deadlift, is whenever she feels set up and good, your body is gonna react and give a little bit. So whenever you feel like you're good, go a little further, because when you start to pull, you're gonna give a little bit. And in the squat, if you're in, a, in this position and you're upright, go a little further, because when you get that weight on your back and you start to go, you're gonna give. So always go a little bit past your comfort zone and you'll fall right where you need to be once the lift starts. Just like her. Yeah. You wanna do some of those close ones? Ooh, so I can uh but. so I can videotape you. Hi, are you ready for this? <laughs> She's a star. Just out in front. <laughs> Just pay attention to me. Kai, come here. Go. Out. Was I supposed to bend a little bit? Bend just a little bit, just enough to get, create flexion. There, really push the glutes through. Good. Very good. Now you'll notice the bar is away from her body, which is something that you never want to do in a competition lift. But in this, that will create momentum going backwards and that's what we're trying to do right here because we're wanting those glutes to have to pull the weight into herself so by pulling in and having that bar just a little bit away see how it starts away from her feet that's going to create the power from the glutes to drop forward so it's kind of like it has to expand so it can retract and one other one other lift that i wanted to have her do to show you guys she was she kept falling forward and Something that happens a lot in the squat is I'll see lifters, they'll get off balance in the squat. This is an excellent tool to use to really train the body to find its balance point and find that leverage point that works best. So go ahead and stand on the side here. Let's do conventional. Now, we're gonna do those three inch pauses. She's gonna pull the, the weight off the floor about three inches and pause for a two count. And what's gonna happen is if she's in her back and leaning forward, 
she's automatically going to correct and the hips will drop because the body wants to be balanced the body wants to be where it's physically the strongest and hanging out here is not where that's at and it's being behind the weight is not where that's at the body will balance itself so use a light weight you know 50 60 maybe 70 percent if you're strong uh, to find the balance point so pull up three inches pause See, she's a little bit forward, but she corrected. So do it again. See how much better the hips got that time? Each set is going to get better and better because she's starting to feel herself out. All right, and by doing that, look, that was the best one yet. Every rep should get better because she's finding that balance point. Now, go ahead and pause for me at your knees. This is the most important point. I hear people talking all the time. Look. Shoulders over the elbow over the wrist in line with the knee in line with the ankle that that allows her to stand up in the straightest possible. That's enough The one thing that I hear people argue over and over and over about well You should start with a straight back so-and-so starts with a rounded back I don't really care so much how you start is how you get to your knees if you get to your knees in the proper position I'm very rounded back Constantine Konstantinovs has pulled well into the 900s with a rounded back Benny Magnuson is a thousand pound puller rounded back. But there are also phenomenal pullers with an extremely straight back. There is no one way. There is no right or wrong. There is what works well for you. And if she gets to the knee in that straight elbow, I mean the shoulder over the elbow, over the wrist, in line with the knee and the ankle, then she got off the floor properly. You cannot start improper and finish proper. So if you get to the knee in the right position, you started in the right position for you. And that's what most of you guys that are, that are newer lifters or younger lifters need to realize. And maybe some of you older lifters need to realize there's no one size fits all. It's how you move. It's how you lift. People's bones are longer. People's joints are bigger. People, people have different variances. So you cannot do a, a one size fits all for anything. You have to go case by case. And the best rule of thumb that I've found for anybody is we all move how we're comfortable. The only lift in powerlifting that is unnatural is the bench press. You squat like a jump, you bench, or you deadlift like a jump. So when she moves, she moves how she's moved for 30 years. I'm not gonna come in here and, and reinvent the wheel. What I'm gonna do is, okay, let's move the hands out a little bit or let's turn the toes out a little bit. It's usually two to three small, small changes that will allow the movement to go from inefficient to efficient. You know, just like on her squat, all she did on her squat, she dropped her pinky under the bar to allow for a little shoulder rotation forward put the bar up about a half an inch on her back so she was more upright and turned her toes out so she could actually allow the knees to traction out. And now her squat went from a lean to a very upright position just as if she would jump. Three small changes, finger under the bar, bar a little higher, toes out, and it pushed with the knees. So we'll call it four changes. Boom. There was no, take your feet way out here, put your feet way in here, get the bar way down your back. She looks like a natural athlete. And that's what we're trying to do is make these as athletically efficient as possible. Hell yeah. No, I'm professional. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Still in training. Should I do a couple? What do you want to do? <laughs> it's your video. This is your video for your YouTube channel. For mine? Yep. All right, watch, watch how I pull this 135. You <laughs> Make sure I do it correctly. And here's the other thing. One of the cues that I gave her is so many times people don't know what to do with their head. I tell her to just find a good distance point out in front of her. Don't look up, don't look down. Get in your starting position and hold it for just a second and you'll see something right here. Her head is gonna be in a very natural position to her spine. Look, perfectly blind. Maybe even just a hair back, but still really, really close. Now, if she was way down here, where is your body gonna go? If your head is down, your body's gonna fall forward. If your head is too far back, your balance is gonna shift back. So for her, she's in a natural position, very athletic, very ready to explode. And that's what we're looking for is explosive power. Good. Now, you'll see as the head rotates down just a little bit, but it actually stays where it started. So the head stays neutral. Perfect. Now, one other tip, and we're gonna use you as the example. So many people have been told narrow stance, narrow grip. 
Well, in the, in the real world, there are people who are very, very broad across the chest, like myself. When I grab the bar, I'll do it. I'll get it. Yeah. When I get up to the bar, if I'm in this position and I grab in here, look at what happens. My shoulders round in, my back automatically rounds. And when I get to the top, not only am I locked out here, but I have to continue pulling to lock out here. So being that I'm broad across here, I have wide hips and a little bit narrower stance. For me, the easy, the easy fix is to come down, grab just a little bit wider on the bar so my shoulders are out, turn the elbows in, upright, and as I stand, let the arms hang. Now, I don't, have, I don't have anywhere to go with the shoulders because they're already expanded and rotated back. If you're trying to do this all at the end with a maximum deadlift, you're really gonna be hurting. And for young powerlifters, if a judge sees you get here on your first lift and your third lift you're struggling and you kind of stop here, he's gonna remember and it's gonna be red lights. So do the right thing from the beginning. Open your hands up, turn the toes out just a little bit and allow yourself to be comfortable and athletic. Pull up and stop. You don't have to go all the way here to lock out because if you go too far, then the knees flex and you've come undone anyway. It's no longer a lockout. So Dana has really big delts, but she's still kind of compact and narrow. We were working with Rob, who's broad and wide, wider hand grip, fixed a lot of his issues. She needs to stay a little bit narrower because she's compact. Science leverages. <laughs> Geometry. Geometry. Wonderful. History. 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 School. School. Physics. Math. Physics. Math. Physics. Physics. Algebra. I like that I feel completely different. I don't feel it like back anymore. It's all legs. Say this again. I mean, this is really important to hear because I hear so many strength athletes and strength coaches, shame on you. We don't want to hurt our athletes back. Well, teach them how to fucking deadlift. Yeah, you know, teach I don't them how feel to... it in my back at all anymore. Exactly. Huh? I used to always just, I would have to have so many, I wouldn't deadlift because it would suffer all the rest of my workouts the next like couple days because my lower back would hurt. And now I don't even feel it in my lower back. It's all hamstrings, glutes, and legs and nothing. And now she can selectively work her, her lower back. If the lower back was a weakness, she can do things like back raises, uh, good mornings, things like that that will strengthen the back, but you selectively want to pick which muscle groups you're activating and working. On the deadlift, never going to get more power than from the legs, ever. Yeah, makes a difference. I'm doing a couple more because I feel good right now. One thing you will notice when she goes, the hips rise just a little bit to catch, and once that hip socket is engaged, then the arms just become hooks. They're just there to hold and finish at the very, very top. Couldn't get any better than that. Looks so much better. I know. If anybody wants to go back and watch like <laughs> your last funny. couple videos, <laughs> and then look at your form there. now, yeah. Here's the thing. She was in a position before where her strength was going to carry her because she, let's, let's face it, I mean, she's, she's one of the best athletes in the world and she has the capability to be extremely strong even with bad form. But now she has to go backwards a little bit and stay true to the form, work her way back up, even if that means being weaker for six weeks, 10 weeks, whatever it is. In the big picture, my estimation is, I don't want to, I don't want to say a number, because he already I, told me a number. I, I, I gave her a number to shoot for, but I think within the next six months, you're going to see a radical change, not only in her form from what it was to, to how we've seen it today, to probably even a little better because she's going to get more and more comfortable. But you're going to see numbers that grow at a, at, at, you know, just a, a completely different rate than ever expected before because now she is that athlete that is extremely strong, that completely capable of gaining muscle mass but now she has the form to do it. And when everything comes together, that's a perfect storm for strength. Boom. Explosions, fireworks. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, I like deadlifting though. That's, that's the cool thing. Kai doesn't care. Kai does not care. She's a big baby. She's a big baby. Oh, the one point. more before my battery dies. Oh, <laughs> Good. The best one. 
Sure, that one. <laughs> I think she's gonna get really strong. Hopefully.